the history of intelligence testing and who's involved. In 1904, the French government appointed a commission to find a way to identify students that needed special education. Alfred Binet and his doctoral student Theodore Simon designed a variety of tasks that were representative of children's abilities at various ages. This could then be used to decide what intellectual development a certain child had. Binet felt that intellectual development was affected by both environment and heredity. The Binet-Simon scale consisted of 30 tasks of increasing complexity. The easiest tasks could be accomp accomplished by any child, even the severely retarded. For instance, the examiner may ask to shake hands with the child. Harder tasks included defining simple words, comparing two items, or repeating seven random digits. In 1908, H.H. H. Goddard brought this scale to the United States and translated it into English. The Simon Binet test was published in 1905. It's one of the first examples of an adaptive test where the examiner uses what he knows about the child to decide where to begin the testing and then only uses those items or questions that are appropriate. An example of this nowadays is the adaptive computer test where if you answer a question, the computer then decides whether to give you a harder question or an easier question. This type of testing reduces the time needed by the interviewer and the child and also decreases the frustration of using items that are too hard or too easy. In 1913, the United States Public Health Service administered a version of the test to immigrants arriving at Ellis Island. These professional researchers were studying eugenics and had a reason to decide how intelligent the immigrants were. Their results concluded that most of the Italians, Hungarians, Jews, and Russians were feeble-minded. Rather than challenging the validity of using the test in this manner, these results served to reinforce negative images of immigrants. Terman was a strong supporter of eugenics. In fact, in his doctoral thesis, he used mental tests to distinguish what he called unusually backward students from very bright students. In 1906, while at Stanford University, he published a revised scale specifically for American populations. In 1916, he adopted Stern's suggestion that the traditional ratio between mental age and chronological age should be multiplied one by 100 to get rid of the decimals. The resulting intelligence quotient, or IQ, is the same as we use it now. The formula is IQ is equal to your mental age divided by your chronological age times 100. If your mental age is 27 and your chronological age is 35, plugging it into this formula then gives you an IQ of less than 100. Robert Yerkes was a major in the Army, a psychologist, and also the head of the American Psychological Association, now known as the APA. Yes, as in APA format. He was tasked by the Army to develop a test that could be given to new recruits to determine their intelligence and their fitness for being placed as officers, enlisted men, or other. Since the Simon Binet test was so expensive and took so much time to give individually, this group test was an answer that they were looking for. Yerkes and his staff developed two tests. The Army Alpha test was a written test for recruits that could read, while the beta test was given orally. If a recruit could not pass or even attempt the beta test, then an individual interview was given. These tests were administered to over two million soldiers. After World War I, the tests were also used in a wide variety of things like industry and screening. Let's take a look at the alpha test. Here's an example of questions taken from the alpha test. You may pause the video at this point and write your answers to these 12 questions. There are additional questions here. After you have found your answers, you may check the solution by going to this website. It starts, the URL is historymatters.gmu.edu slash d as in dog slash 5293. The beta test, remember, was for people who could not read. Let's look at an example here. In this test, they were given a series of figures that have something missing and asked to draw in the missing part. Number one is missing a mouth. They needed to draw in a mouth correctly. 
how they fixed the pictures was as important. For example, on number four, what's missing? Yes, the spoon for the soup bowl. It was very important how the recruit or other person drew the spoon. Did they draw it vertically or horizontal? Was the bowl of the spoon towards the mouth or not? Each of these were taken into effect. This particular test, as well as the other one, was very culturally and ethnically situated. For example, consider number five. What is missing in this picture? Did you see that the chimney above the, the house is not there? But if you grew up in a warm country that didn't have fireplaces, you might ha have any clue what that thing on the side of the house is, much less what is missing. So depending on the ability and the experiences of the recruit, this may have been an unfair test. For example, many of the recruits had never held a pencil before and certainly had not seen this type of test to know how to draw something on it.